Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, perfect. I will let you take over. It's all yours. All right. Hi, everybody. So my name is Glenn Schweitzer. I'm 29 years old, and I live with a somewhat rare chronic illness called Meniere's disease. Now, if you haven't heard of it, I'm not really surprised. I hadn't heard of it either when I was first diagnosed. It only affects about 0.2% of the population, so that's like one out of every 500 or so people. And it's not fatal, but there's no cure, and it can really mess up your quality of life with some pretty severe symptoms. So typically, it's characterized by four primary symptoms, and these symptoms come in these episodes, or, or attacks, as they're commonly referred to, and you'll understand why in a minute. So, so the experience is typically these attacks of violent rotational vertigo, where the room will just start to spin around you. It's just like you'll go, you know, sometimes there's warning signs, um, but often there isn't. Often, you know, for a lot of people, they have what's called a drop attack and just balance disappears and they collapse to the ground without even a chance to brace for impact. So that's, that's the worst and main symptom is this rotational vertigo where the room will just start to spin. Um, but it also comes with a few other pretty severe symptoms. You get this ear pressure, uh, it's like this feeling of fullness <clears throat> or uh, fluid, almost like you have a bad cold, but all the time. Um, it can be very uncomfortable, it can be very painful at times, and it can cause like sound sensitivity and, and a few other secondary symptoms. Um, it also comes with hearing loss that fluctuates, so when the symptoms arise, you'll get this sort of fluctuating um, hearing loss uh, that is progressive over time. So each, each time you have an attack, most of your hearing will, will come back, but over time it can destroy your hearing entirely and leave you deaf in your ear or affected ears. And lastly, it has um, tinnitus, which is like a loud ringing or some, some people experience other noises, but it's loud ringing in your ears uh, when there is none. If, you've, if you, any of you have been in like a loud concert and you hear your ears ringing the next day, it's like that, except it's all the time and it never stops. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about my journey to getting a diagnosis and what it's like to live with a chronic uh, invisible illness. Um, I, over the years, I've experienced a lot of, a lot of pain and suffering and heartache, uh, but I've also am lucky that I've had a lot of success as well. I've been able to build a really incredible life for myself um, from a place of adversity. And, and my hope is that some of the things that I learned along the way will be able to help you one day be more effective with your patients. Um, so I guess a good place to start is, I'll, I'll take you all the way back to the beginning. Um, I was diagnosed in late 2011, but it all, everything started probably five or six months prior to that. The first real symptom that I experienced, and at the time I had no idea any of this was connected or anything was actually happening to me, was probably dizziness. Um, I was in college at the time. I was 24 years old. I was at Florida Atlantic University, which is in Boca Raton, Florida. And I was, I was doing a business uh, IT degree. So I was in computer labs a lot of the time. Um, and I remember I have all these memories of sitting at the computer and just feeling this feel sense of uh, unbalance. Uh, so I was, I'd be sitting at my desk and I would, I, the room would sort of wobble a little bit. I would get this, this, like this fuzzy feeling in my head where it made it very hard to focus. The teachers would talk and the words would sort of just, I, I wouldn't get the meaning. It, none of it would sort of register. And I, it, it was, it was this sense of dizziness and, and my first sort of taste of this thing called brain fog, which is this fluctuating um, cognitive impairment that's common with Meniere's disease, but also with dozens and dozens of other chronic illnesses as well. It's this mental fatigue, hard to focus um, sort of state. Uh, so I'm going through class and I'm, have, I'm starting to get these weird like balance symptoms, but nothing, nothing's really connecting um, at this point. The first 
real sign that maybe something was wrong uh, happened when I was on vacation. I was with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, uh, Megan, who you'll hear me to refer to throughout the my story. Um, we were in Los Angeles. We had a wedding the next day in San Diego, and we were kind of on a, a whirlwind tour of LA, um, going from place to place to place, meeting with friends. Um, and I was feeling really dizzy, this sense that I was um, like the wobbliness, the lack of focus, the same sort of things I was, I was getting in class. I was getting on the beginning of the trip, but I sort of pushed through it. And I remember the first morning we woke up and we started in the Santa Monica Pier. And I think we had some like coffees and pastries or something like that for breakfast. And we were headed off to sort of see the whole city. And so our first stop was in Venice Beach. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's this sort of really busy, uh, bustling place. There's tons of like vendors selling art and, and trinkets and things on the street. Uh, tons of people, tons of things going on. Uh, very busy place, very uh, visually stimulating, um, which would, was going to be a problem. I just didn't know it at the time. And so we walked around the boardwalk for about an hour or two. I think we got some more coffee at one of these nice coffee shops in LA. And when we got back to the car, like I remember walking back and just feeling that, that sense of fuzziness again, but worse than it had ever been before. It felt like I was walking through like a cloud, like this really dense haze. And, and by the time we got back to the car, I, I felt this, like I, I sat down to drive and I felt this panic just grab me, like this just rise up from my stomach and grab me. And everything just went real wobbly and, and, and I, just, I just couldn't focus. And I remember I, I, I had started to drive and like a block later, I, I pulled over and I just sort of put my head down and I, and I, I told Megan, I said, look, you gotta, you're gonna have to drive. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm not, I can't drive. I don't feel safe with this. And for the rest of the trip, it didn't go away. Uh, Megan ended up driving us for the entirety of the vacation. So at the time I was still very young. I, uh, like I said, I was 24 years old and I guess I was very much in denial and I did what most young, relatively healthy people would do in that situation. And I, I really did nothing. I guess I felt invincible at the time. Uh, so when the trip ended, we went back home and I w tried to readapt to life. I went back to school, um, but things were slowly getting worse and a pattern was starting to emerge and I just wasn't seeing it, but everyone else was. Megan certainly was. I was yelling a lot more. Apparently my hearing had been affected and I didn't know. Um, and I was, I was getting this, the dizziness and the, un, the imbalance more of the time. My ears, I've always, I've had tinnitus the ringing in my ears for as long as I can remember. Um, I, it, I guess it runs in my family. A lot of my family members have it, but it was never really a problem. But now, now all of a sudden it was a problem. It was very loud and intrusive. I was make, that was making it hard to focus. This like loud ringing all the time. Um, and it, everything just sort of progressed over the following months. Um, the first, I remember the next sort of milestone in this time period, we, we had gone out to eat at a, a local steakhouse and I think I had like a bacon wrapped filet or something like that with like garlic mashed potatoes, a very salty meal. And I, I didn't, at the, salt is a big trigger for a lot of people with Meniere's disease. There's a lot of different triggers, uh, but for me, salt is something that triggers my symptoms pretty strongly. And I remember leaving that restaurant and just like feeling the wobble start, feeling the dizziness start. And we, we headed over to a coffee shop for dessert. And I remember as we got into the coffee shop, I just felt like this shift and my balance just like, I just, it was hard to stand up. The room wasn't so much spinning, maybe a little bit. It was, in hindsight, it was a very minor vertigo attack, um, but I didn't know anything at the time. I, I thought I had food poisoning. I felt very nauseous. I remember I ran to the bathroom and I just, I was so like violently ill. I didn't even make it to the toilet in time. And I remember I have this like visceral memory of just sitting on the floor in the bathroom, like the room sort of like moving and just, just feeling this terrible fear and, and panic. And I remember I texted Megan and, you know, I said, you need to come in here. Like something's really wrong with me. And she came to the bathroom and I remember this look on her face and it was, it was concern. But at the time, like, I just felt so much shame. Like it's hard to explain why, but I, it's, it's a common theme when, you, when you're when you dealing with like a chronic invisible illness like this, this shame, like this sense that there's something wrong with you. Um, and so she helped me get cleaned up and, you know, we went home and, and for her, the pattern, every, the pattern was becoming more and more clear. For me, I was just convinced that I had food poisoning and I told everyone I knew not to eat at that restaurant anymore. 
Uh, but fast forward a little bit, this, this, this sort of thing started happening more often. Um, I have, I'm not gonna, I don't need to detail all the stories, but I started having more of these like episodes where, you know, everything would sort of ramp up a bit. And still I was in denial. I remember it just kept getting worse and worse. And I was suffering without any kind of understanding or grasp of, of my situation. And this went on for probably several months. And it all came to a head um, one evening after class when I had just a massive vertigo attack that destroyed me. And at this point, I mean, it was undeniable what happened next. I had left class. Um, it was a night and evening class. Um, and I drove over to Megan's apartment. At the time, she lived a few minutes away from the school. Um, and I grabbed uh, food on the way home. I think probably like Wendy's or something. We had a uh, cheeseburger and fries, if, if I can remember right. Um, and we got home, um, and I think we were just hanging out on the couch, eating, watching Seinfeld reruns or something like that. And I, I finished eating and I stood up to throw away my trash. And as I turned back to the couch, just, I remember like this lurch, this lurching feeling as, as the room just started to spin, like violently spin, uh, like very, very quickly. And I remember I sort of fell onto the couch and just sort of held on for dear life. I mean, when, when, when a real vertigo attack hits you, like it just, it, it often happens out of nowhere. You, you can't focus your eyes. You don't know what's happening. A lot of times you have a panic attack at the same time because it's, it's very scary. Um, and your balance system is very tied into your nervous system. So you, you'll get like this rush of adrenaline, this flood of adrenaline and this, this sense of panic that feeds off each other and, and makes everything worse. And I remember just, being immobilized on the couch, like as the minutes ticked by and it lasted for the better part of an hour. And I'm lucky that Megan was there to help me and, you know, to support me, although there really wasn't anything she could do in the moment. And I'm lucky that it didn't happen over a staircase or, or somewhere or driving in my car or somewhere more dangerous, which is something that happens to people often. Um, so 45 minutes or an hour later, everything sort of started to stabilize the, you know, the room stopped spinning and I just was left with this. I felt like I had been in a car accident. I, I, everything was just, I had no energy. I just completely drained of, of all energy, mental and physical, physical energy and just had, I could barely think straight. And I, I didn't as much as fall asleep as just lost consciousness. Um, the next morning I woke up and I remember just, I had all these emotions, but I still felt like just like a zombie. Like I, there was, there was no energy there. A lot of times when, when you have these episodes, it just completely drains you of entirely. And a lot of, most people end up having to sleep for the rest of the day or for hours afterwards. Um, but the next morning I, I was, felt like a bad hangover. Um, and I woke up and I remember talking to Megan and, you know, I was just like, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready now. I'm going to, I'll get help. I'll see a doctor. And I sort of had resolved myself finally, like, okay, there is, there is something really wrong with me and I, I need to get to the bottom of this. And there was sort of like a finality with the thought, like I thought, okay, well, there is something wrong with me. I'm, you know, I, I'll acknowledge that, but I'm, I'm going to the doctor and that, you know, this, I'll take care of this. Like this will be, you know, the ones, this will be handled and I'll be able to move on. So I, the first thing I did was I went on the internet and I pulled up my health insurance's website and I found a local ENT uh, or a few local ENTs and I called around until I found one that was able to take me for an appointment that day. So I drove up to this doctor's office and it was right around the corner from Meg's apartment. I didn't have to drive that, drive very far. And I remember sitting in the waiting room and just feeling this, like just feeling panic and just fear and just so, so scared, um, trying to wrap my head around like what possibly could be causing these crazy symptoms. And I was kind of going over all, you know, trying to think back as far as I could, like, when did this start? What, what, you know, trying to put the pieces together, trying to bring it all into my mind so I could communicate it clearly to this doctor I was going to see. And finally, they called me into the room. And the doctor, he's an older guy. Um, he's, you know, very kind of looked at me, very not too much emotion on his face, kind of just like a sterile look. And, um, you know, he said, hello, Mr. Schweitzer, you know, what's, what's going on? How can I help you? And so I, I decided I decided um, to start with the previous night, the, the 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 attack, and then work my way backwards. And as I'm talking, you know, more details are coming into my head, and and you know, 
the pieces are sort of falling into place as I'm explaining the story, or at least, you know, seeing that there was more of a connection than I had seen before. So I go through everything, the trip, the dizziness, the, the, the ear pressure, how it's like I'm yelling and it's hard to hear and, the, you know, all these different things. And he's taking notes. And I, I remember I finished my story and, and he looks up at me and just like a robot, just no emotion um, in, his, in his face at all. He just says, okay, you have Meniere's disease. It's, there's no cure. They don't know what causes it. Uh, you, you know, it describes everything you just mentioned, the vertigo, the, the tinnitus, the hearing loss, the, 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 the unbalance and all of it. And he's like, you know, you have to, he's like, I'll write you a prescription for a diuretic and prednisone, a, you know, which is a steroid. And he said, you need to stop drinking coffee. You need to stop drinking caffeine. You need to stop eating chocolate. You need to start exercising. You need to stop drinking alcohol. You need to cut out rattling off like a million things. And I remember just feeling like, it's just like the enormity of it hit me all at once. And I just got like, I just pulled like work, like I hear like incurable, like going deaf, you know, uh, change everything. And I just, my head is is spinning and I'm, I'm like not even able to grasp like what he's saying. And I'm always, I've been the kind of person where, you know, with doctors, like I always like to understand what's happening with my health. I, I, I'll always ask a lot of questions, especially if I'm, if I'm nervous, if there's something serious. And now this doctor is giving me, you know, telling me I have this, incurable chronic disease that's going to make me go deaf and I, I just I started asking questions you know I'm like well what about this and maybe it's this and can you explain this and he was just getting more and more flustered and and like I, he's sort of answering and sort of not and maybe he just didn't know the answers but he's, he's just sort of like I see him getting flustered and all of a sudden he started yelling at me and he's like what are you the doctor now He's like, are, are you the expert? Like, you have this. Like, this is the, the you have Meniere's disease. You have to make these changes or you're going to go deaf. You're going to have X, Y, and Z. And I remember just feeling so defeated, just so broken, just utterly and completely broken. Um, just no hope at all. And I left that day in just such a bad place. And I, it's really unfortunate that it happened this way um, because it was unnecessary. But I went home and I did what most people would do in that situation. I, I went online and I started Googling uh, the symptoms and doing my own research. And I guess maybe sometimes, I guess maybe sometimes. Uh, but it wasn't in this case. Um, it's such a complicated uh, and misunderstood condition that everything you read conflicts with everything else you read. And then you just see, you find case after case after case of the worst report of suffering. I mean, just the absolute just cases of people whose, whose lives have been destroyed. And I'm coming from this place of despair and I'm just, I have lost hope entirely. I, I have, I really truly believe that like my life as I knew it was over, that I had no more chance of being, having like a productive, happy life. And I, I it sort of spiraled out. I, I, I got very depressed. It was one of the lowest points in my entire life. Um, and through it all, I mean, my, my first reaction was to sort of um, like a last ditch effort of denial. I, 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 I didn't make any of the changes. I didn't take the medication. I just prayed that something would get better or anything. And of course it didn't, it got worse. Um, so during this time, as, as like messed up as I was, I, sort of decided that if there was a chance that I could maybe improve a little bit, I should at least try. And I, I filled the prescriptions um, that he had prescribed and both the diuretic and the uh, steroid like prednisone are known to help um, alleviate some of the ear pressure and, and reduce the symptoms. In some cases, everyone experiences it differently um, and it's not important why that's the case. Um, but I went and filled the prescriptions. I started taking the medications um, I started exercising as, as much as I could with the level of balance that I had. I, I, I started on the stationary bike and I, I started working out a little uh, on the treadmill a little bit. Um, I wasn't very healthy at the time. Um, I, I, so I improved my diet. I, I, I tried this low sodium um, diet that he had recommended. And I started to improve a little bit. I mean, very minor, but like it was a promising sign. It was it was enough of a sign that it opened my mind to receive what happened next. Uh, it opened my mind enough to receive what happened next. 
So I'm, I'm having these, you know, during this time, my family is really pushing me for, to get a second opinion. Like they, I told everyone what happened with this first doctor and everyone was really supportive. Um, but everyone wanted me to get another opinion. Um, so my grandfather was able to find this uh, a specialist at the University of Miami Hospital. Um, he's a type of doctor known as a neurotologist, who is essentially an ENT that subspecialized in treating balance and hearing disorders. Um, so he, he was able to refer me to this doctor and I was able to get an appointment for like 10 days out, which was surprising because the doctor is the head of the otolaryngology department at the Miami hospital. And he is fairly popular. So usually you have to wait a while to get an appointment. So I get an appointment and during the week leading up, uh, I remember I was slowly improving. Like my ear pressure had gone down a little bit. Um, so my hearing had come back a little bit. Um, and I wasn't as dizzy. Like I was having like moments, like days were like for part of the day, my, my symptoms were a lot less. And the only problem was like the, the medications he had prescribed me were, ma were messing up my sleep. The prednisone was making it really difficult to fall asleep. And the diuretic was making me wake up like every hour to go to the bathroom and the lack of sleep was um, really messing with, it was, it was exacerbating everything. So I had stopped taking the medications. Uh, but I finally, the, you know, the, the day arrives and I go to the University of Miami. It's about an hour south of where I live. I drove myself down and it's a big building. I remember walking up to the otolaryngology uh, department, which took up like half of the building. <laughs> Um, so this massive lobby and there was dozens of people in there, like couches and chairs. There was multiple reception windows. And I remember going up and getting registered, waiting for about 30, 40 minutes and just kind of, I, I felt a, the first, you know, glimmer of hope at this, point. like maybe like I, I could improve a little bit. Uh, I still believed that, you know, I was, it was going to be a hard, difficult life, but that maybe I had, you know, had some chance of, of finding happiness. So finally, they call me into the office, and the way it works at this hospital is that first you're seen by a student in residency at the hospital. So I remember this young guy came in and uh, spent about half an hour with me. He listened to my story, and you know it was very, it was, it was, it was from the beginning, it was a very different experience. He was very friendly and warm. Um, you know, he listened, he asked questions, I asked questions. It was more of like a dialogue, um, and it was, it was very encouraging. And you know, he, he. He said, you know, listen, it, it does sound like Meniere's disease. I know the doctor is going to want to run some tests. And he sort of gave me an idea of what to expect um, moving forward, you know, what, what to expect with the doctor. And so I left him. And finally, I got to see this specialist. And I remember this very clearly. I came into the room, and it was just such a stark contrast to my first doctor. This guy was warm and kind um, and compassionate. Uh, he 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 greeted me warmly and shook my hand and had a smile on his face and just a complete you know just just from the beginning like this show of emotion just changed the dynamic of the experience so drastically um so I, with him again you know he said you know tell me tell me what's been happening tell me your whole story start from the beginning so again i i you know i start i tell him everything that's happened and but now i can you know report a little bit of good news i can tell you know i told him about some of the changes i had made some of the ways i was trying to improve my health and he just he listened attentively and he gave me hope for the real hope for the first time he he answered all my questions he asked questions back and you know we we carried on this dialogue he validated my pain and my fears and, and at the same you know like with realistically validated it but at the same time he he shared stories of some of his other patients who who had done well and, and, and it ended up, you know, having a lot of success and, and were able to manage their symptoms. You know, he told me that um, there was no reason to expect that I was going to go deaf, which is something I had been trying to accept. I was convinced that I was going to go deaf at some point, and that's a t I, have, I'm, I have it bilaterally in both ears, so I was convinced at some point I was going to lose my hearing, and that's a terrifying thing to have to live with as a young person. Um, but he said, you know, if you can, if you can improve your health to the point where you stop having these vertigo attacks, you know, you're not, there's no reason to believe that you're going to lose your, your, your hearing. And it was such a different experience. Um, he, he really gave me the will to fight and he really gave me hope uh, for the first time. He, he had painted a picture where 
I could be okay one day. And, and I eventually was. And before him, I didn't even know that there was hope. I didn't even know that there was a chance to get better, that it was even possible. And it terrifies me to think of what my life might have looked like if I never met this guy. It's, it's, it was like my light bulb moment. It was like the defining moment of my journey that this guy, I realized that it was not going to define me, that I still had power, that I still had control, that I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't choose to have this thing, but that I still had control over all other aspects of my life. And I resolved myself to fight it in any way I could to, to just fight for my life and do everything in my power to improve my symptoms and try to recover my health. Um, and so it started me on this journey and, and I can see with like, a cl it's so clear now in hindsight, like that my life just took on this completely different trajectory um, from that moment forward. And I was lucky too, that I had a very supportive um, family and, 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 and significant other. Uh, Megan was, she had never gave up hope even for a second, even in my darkest times. Um, my family was, most of them live in an, uh, a different state. Um, and while they're, you know, they're all extremely supportive and, you know, um, more so than most. And it's, it's a hard thing to be supportive of because when you're dealing with an invisible illness, like you can't see vertigo on my face. You can't tell if I'm not feeling well just by looking at me. So people tend to underestimate the severity of, of your experience. But I was lucky that I had a very supportive family. Um, it's hard for a lot of families to accept um, when a patient has uh, these types of symptoms. Like it's hard for them to believe uh, in what the patient is experiencing and that can make it really difficult um, for the patient. So there's a few things that I hope you guys can take away from my story and, and my journey. Um, the, the first of which is that empathy and understanding goes such a long way. I, I've been very cognizant of it ever since that point. Um, like anytime I see a doctor, I'm always very aware of like the doctors or the healthcare professionals like demeanor um, and, and outlook and mindset. And it's just, there's so, it's so often you just encounter this cold, sterile environment. And I, and I, I can understand it. I get why a doctor or a healthcare provider needs to disconnect on some level to not just constantly absorb the pain of their patients and, you know, the suffering of their patients. I get that that can burn you out pretty quickly. Um, but I don't think that, that, uh, that it's mutually exclusive from having empathy and understanding. I think a little bit of compassion can really change the dynamic um, when you're working with patients. Uh, it's, it's hard to feel like your, your, your healthcare provider is, is on your side otherwise. Sometimes it, it, just, it can just feel like instruction um, and it's hard, it's hard to feel like they're on your team and, and in the journey with you. And when you're dealing with such a complicated illness, like that's such an important part of getting better is you need to have this sense that your, your, your caregiver is on the same page with you, is on the same side as you. Um, so I guess my suggestion would be to offer realistic hope and positivity whenever you can. Show your patients, your future patients, like um, a world where they can salvage their quality of life and, and be okay again. If, if you don't do that, they may never know that it was even possible and they, may never try, they, they might never try as hard as they could have tried. So always take the time to, to um, li really listen and listen to their story and, and answer their questions. If they have questions and they want to understand the process and they want to understand, you know, what, what's going on and how they're going to heal, take the time to explain it. A lot of times understanding the process can be incredibly motivating um, for a patient. Um, especially, especially people like me, I, everyone will be like that. Like a lot of people will just accept the advice as they're told. But if, if a patient ever wants to understand, don't take that as, try not to take it as argumentative or, or like a difficult patient as, as a lot of healthcare providers do, but try to, try to see it as a patient coming from a place of just wanting to understand and be more involved, um, with their health. Because these like Meniere's disease and, and other invisible illnesses, especially other vestibular disorders, other balance conditions, um, they can be very difficult to live with. They're very complex. They can be very difficult to diagnose. Meniere's disease is a diagnosis of exclusion, uh, meaning that it's diagnosed by ruling out other possible causes of your symptoms. They still don't know what causes it. Um, a lot of the research shows that it, and, and what I personally believe is that it's more of a basket diagnosis, that it's a set of symptoms that are caused by multiple different underlying conditions. 
Um, but the point, the point being, they can be very complicated and it takes oftentimes um, a lot of different doctor visits and, 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 and work to reach that point of diagnosis. And, and a lot of these patients will go from doctor to doctor to doctor for years sometimes before they ever are able to discover what's actually wrong with them. And so, you know, in this, in this difficult sort of life that they're leading, you know, their friends, our friends and family members and, and society at large are consistently underestimating the pain and, and the, the severity of the pain and the, the, um, the effect it's having on your life. But you guys can be the ones who understand. You guys can be the people who validate their experience and help them heal in a world where they're largely ignored. Um, the medical system as it stands today is, is very disjointed. Uh, it's, it's hard for do multiple doctors and different specialties and different healthcare providers and therapists to collaborate effectively. There's no one like database medical system where they can all collaborate and share notes and, and work together. And even when they do and, and they overcome these odds, it can take years for the latest research and new treatments to trickle down to the point where a practicing doctor or therapist can implement these uh, new techniques. Uh, most healthcare providers are working long hours, at, you know, practicing long hours, and they have lives outside of work. So if they're if they're you know seeing patients 50 hours a week and then going home to spend time with their family and and hobbies, they're probably not you know in their free time taking doing research and staying on top of the latest you know uh, clinical trials and research and you know. Um, staying on top of everything. So for better or worse, the patients oftentimes have to be their own advocate. And especially when you're dealing with like a complicated illness, like a balance disorder, um, you have to coordinate your own effort and, and carry information from one, um, from one place to another. And it can be very overwhelming and very isolating when, when your doctor or therapist or healthcare provider doesn't, isn't ready to listen. But again, you guys can be the ones who are ready to listen, to hear what the patients have to say, to work with them and to show just a little bit of compassion and empathy along the way. So I hope that you guys can take that away um, from my experience. And just to finish this up, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what my life has been like um, since the diagnosis. So it's been about five, uh, five years, almost six years now. And my health has steadily improved for the most part. I have not had a vertigo attack in several years. Uh, I live not symptom free, but I, I have gotten to a place where I'm managing my symptoms to a point where it doesn't impact my life very much. I still have to do a lot of careful um, lifestyle management. I still have to eat low sodium. I can't drink too much caffeine. Um, I have to get enough sleep and, and you know, I, I meditate to keep my stress levels down. Um, but I'm largely able to, to live a pretty good life. And from that place, I, I started several projects to help others. Um, it, it started with a blog that I, I began a few years back called Mind Over Meniere's. And I, I realized at the time that I wanted to start some kind of writing project and I, I didn't know what it was going to be. And as I was brainstorming, I, I was thinking like, you know what, I have done pretty well with Meniere's disease and maybe, maybe other people could use a little bit of, you know, hope and inspiration. Like I thought back on my experience and I started the, the, a blog to sort of share that, to, to provide like a better um, place for people to gather information and, and, and in a positive light, which is something that was missing for so many people. And, it, and it's been amazing to build this community. Um, from that, I, I wrote a book also called Mind Over Meniere's. Um, that's done okay by self-publishing standards, at least. I've sold like maybe about 1,200 copies in the last year. Um, and I've also started to uh, work with the Vestibular Disorders Association, uh, which is a, a they're, they're actually fairly small in the world of nonprofits in the US, but there aren't many um, organizations that sort of serve this community. Uh, but the Vestibular Disorders Association is the best of the ones that do. Uh, so I started doing a lot of volunteer work and advocacy work with them. Um, we've done some really interesting pro projects. They sort of exist to educate and raise awareness and be a resource for patients with balance disorders. Um, and 
um, it's been all of these things have been very fulfilling and, and just sort of shaped my life in a way that I could never have expected, uh, never have hoped, even hoped for or, you know, seen it as a possibility all those years ago. And moving forward in the future, I'm, I have all sorts of other new projects that I'm working on that are in this sort of same vein. I have another new website and book that I'm launching now um, to help tinnitus patients, uh, people who have ringing in their ears, which is a much larger um, problem than just Meniere's disease. I think the latest research showed it's something like 10 to 15 percent of the general population experiences uh, ringing in their ears or some sort of noise in their ears. And um, so I, I'm, I'm working to help help others. And it's just been a very uh, incredible sort of journey. Um, I, I started from this place of just despair and destruction and, and hopelessness. And it's brought me to this very fulfilling and, and enriching life. So that's my story, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. And I, I think we have some time for questions. All right, thank you, Glenn. Any questions? questions? I think our mics are loud enough. If you have a question, you can just probably yell it out. I can hear you. All right, good. No. Are any driving restrictions when you're diagnosed with this disease for like potential, like if something was to happen while you were driving, they could show them that out of the I'm sorry, maybe I can't hear so clearly. Try to try to say that one more time. Can you just relate it that? Yeah. Um, so he was asking if there's any driving restrictions for patients um, with the oh. or did you ever? Okay, yeah. Uh, so technically, yes. Um, I, I know a lot of patients who have who either voluntarily lost their license or ha had it revoked. Um, I think, it, I mean, that's something that you should talk to your doctor about, obviously, case by case is, is going to be different. For someone like me, um, I, my symptoms nowadays, like I, I haven't, like I mentioned, I haven't had vertigo in years. I, I, the worst that will happen once in a while is if, if I sort of lapse from my lifestyle management is I'll get a little bit dizzy. Um, I have brain fog a lot. That's like the one thing that is a constant sort of daily struggle. And I've, I've found a lot of good ways to cope with it and, and overcome that. Um, and, uh, most of the time now, my health is pretty stable. And if like, it sort of follows a progression. So like, if I, if I start, like if I get bad, get sleep, bad sleep, I'll, healthy, I'll slowly sort of, um, it'll escalate. And before it gets to a point, Negatively, I'll, I'll cut it off. I'll cut it off. Okay, so your question, uh, some people have the ability to drive, uh, others don't. I can drive fine. My balance is perfectly fine most of the time. Well, you have to learn sign language since you know where it does go. So he's asking. Um, yeah, I, I, got, I got that one. So that's an interesting question. That's definitely a thought that I've definitely thought a lot about that, especially at the point where um, I didn't have where where I didn't know that there was a like when I had resolved like when I resolved to death before yeah. I knew there was certainty um I that had I was thinking about that that I probably should learn sign language now having said that um I know some people probably do but a lot don't I think when you're when you get when you become like I know people who lost their hearing and you know there's there's options for people who lost their hearing like there's cochlear implants which is if you don't know what that is it's like a brain implant that bypasses the cochlea in the inner ear and um, can restore sound to some degree for people who have lost their hearing. So I know people with Meniere's who have had that procedure um, and before, I, so they, they never learn sign language. So I, I think it's probably a good idea, like if you are losing your hearing to learn sign language. And it's something I've, I've toyed with the idea of, of doing it just as a maybe a just in case sort of a thing. But um, that's interesting. Most people, they don't talk, it's not talked about very much in the community. I'm not sure why. For you to change your lifestyle and your eating patterns and sleeping patterns and all that. Was the question, was it easy? Is that what you said? Well, how hard was it to do that, to change oh. how you, your lifestyle? I gotcha. Um, so, so that's, that's an interesting question too. I, I mean, it was, I, I think a lot of that depends on how motivated like your outlook so i mean at first i had you know after my first experience with the first doctor i just was so hopeless that i, I had no sort of motivation or drive to to try to be better but um once once the the potential was put in front of me then it became much easier then i became very committed and i had like a cause and a purpose and i and i i went 
um, you know, as, as fat, ran as fast and as, as quickly as I could. Um, but what I tell people usually, like, and what I wrote it in my, what I, how I describe it in my book is that everyone experiences it differently. So the, the point of the lifestyle changes is you're, you're trying to avoid these certain things that, that trigger, there's, there's two aspects of it. You're trying to avoid um, environmental factors that trigger uh, your symptoms. And you're also trying to improve your overall health to a point where your body is better able to um, deal with the illness. So like the healthier you are, like overall, the better, the more resources your body will have to be able to fight it off. So what I tell, so not every lifestyle change is going to help everyone. And some people are triggered by things that you can't control, like changes in the barometric pressure. Um, like, so the weather, they're tra triggered by changes in the weather. Obviously you can't control the weather. You can move to a place with better weather, but, um, there's things like that or allergies. So not every lifestyle changes aren't going to help everyone universally. But what I tell people is to think of it like, like in the beginning to, you know, eliminate all the things that are known to trigger the symptoms and think of it as temporary. Like eventually you can go back and sort of test the assumptions and try to figure it out. Um, it's much easier to kind of make these changes in a big sweeping way when it's like when you're thinking of it as like a temporary change and i i don't know that i went through that but i know like just after talking to a lot of people when when they do think of it that way it can be very helpful to make those changes but i mean if you're changing so many things at once and you're already dealing with so much stress and panic and anxiety it's it's it can be very difficult so when you would have an attack did you have any respiratory or cardiac involvement like did you get heart palpitations like your heart beating really fast or your like short of breath or really rapid breath, anything like that? Okay, so, okay, so uh, yeah, sort of, but not, I wouldn't call it like, it, it was more like panic, uh, anxiety symptoms, um, not so, so the rapid heart rate, um, you know, uh, the, the shortness of breath, but, but in the context of like panic and anxiety, uh, it's terrifying. When it happens, like the first time you have a vertigo attack, it's it's terrifying no matter what, whether you know what's happening or not. But when it happens, and you don't know what's happening, it is just you're you're all of a sudden just completely incapacitated. You can't move, you can't stand up. You can it maybe open your eyes, maybe uh, you're you're violently nauseous. The root, the world, everything is just spinning like all these like things you took for granted, like the world just being in one place is gone. It's like you're really really drunk. Like that's that's the closest thing I can link it to but you haven't drank any alcohol you, you you just your mind just starts racing um and i've read research lately that talks there's um a, more of a direct link between the vestibular system and the um i guess like in the nervous system where the anxiety and and vestibular symptoms like can go hand in hand a lot of times so meditation and things like that have helped me but um so yeah it, it's a uh, the heart, like it's, it's more panic. It's more panic symptoms than uh, like heart palpitations or anything like that. Did you have headaches? Okay. So I, but a lot of people do. Uh, and I think, I don't believe that Meniere's disease, that headaches and migraine are linked to Meniere's disease, but there are other vestibular order, vestibular disorders like killer migraine, um, and a few others that do cause headache and migraine and have very similar set of symptoms. And I think the two often are misdiagnosed uh, for each other. Um, but I have never had the migraine headache component of it. Thank you. Do you have to continue medication or were you able to come off of them? So, right, okay, uh, good question. So a lot of people, there's a lot of different like medications that people will try um, that help in varying degrees. It's, it's interesting because no one thing seems to help everybody uh, adversely, which is kind of gives um, credence to the idea that there's, it's multiple diseases with the same set of symptoms. Um, there's evidence that like some of it's genetic, some of it may be like autoimmune caused. Um, but medications, I, so I, the, I had taken the prednisone and the diuretic and I've done, I've gone back on the diuretic bef like for periods of time before, but not for a long time. I'll I take a lot of supplements, you know, vitamins and supplements and things like that to try to be healthy or to cope with brain fog. Um, but I haven't, luckily I haven't needed to be on any uh, sort of um, medication long-term. I haven't needed any surgeries or any more, uh, more intensive or invasive procedures either. Any other burning questions? Is there any sort of like rescue treatment or anything if you feel like it's the onset of an episode, if you had a super, you know, sodium high 
enriched meal that you would be able to do in order to like combat? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so yes, uh, the answer is yes. So there's a, there's a few things. So one of the main um, rescue sort of treatments, like a lot of people will take um, like anti motion sickness, like for in the, over the counter they'll take like anti motion sickness or anti nausea uh, medications. Like, um, but I think the most powerful thing that people do that I haven't needed to do, um, but they'll take uh, benzodiazepines like Valium, acts as a vestibular suppressant. Um, so a lot of times if you take, a vet, some people will take it regularly as like a maintenance sort of thing to, to lower the activity in their vestibular system and kind of like prevent the attacks from happening. Um, but like in a ER type situation, um, that like uh, something like Valium will cause the vertigo severity to lessen or stop. Um, but even more so than that, like a lot of it, I, I, what I've found personally is that um, it's very like, so I mentioned the panic and anxiety that happen when 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 you have this crazy attack happen out of nowhere. Um, when you can, like meditation has played a huge role in in my recovery. Like uh, the ability to like quickly calm myself and like trigger like a relaxation response is huge. So like if I when if you can for a lot of these people if you can find a way to just like quickly get to a safe place like you know it, some people do get warning signs. So if you get these warning signs, you can get to a safe place and start, you know, breathing and start, you know, just calming yourself, a lot of times that can drastically uh, reduce the severity of it. Um, and then also as a more, so that that's sort of in the emergency um, treatment context of things, but, but then also long-term, which is more directly applicable to you guys, is there's something that, uh, called vestibular rehabilitation therapy, which is a type of physical therapy that trains the patient to, um, Re, it retrains their balance system. So that's probably what most of you will have experience with at some point is working in that thing. So there's a lot of different things that can help. Um, the lack of balance is something that like, there's a lot of, so I said it, the episodes, it, the, the symptoms happen in episodes, but there's a lot of things like in between episodes as well. And a, a lack of balance, uh, just a lack of, of stability, a constant, you know, wobbliness is very common and things like that can help as well. So there are a lot of different treatments and, and ways to try to manage the symptoms, but because we still ha don't understand what's causing any of it, there is no specific cure, uh, unfortunately, at this point. So, anyone else? Um, you mentioned that you haven't had a, like one of those intense vertigo attacks in a while. Do you fear that you will eventually have another one, or are you like feeling pretty confident that with your lifestyle changes that that won't be an issue. Also, also a good question. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, if I, I do have on some level, like it's the, the disease is progressive and, and, you know, a lot of times what people will experience is like, they'll have years of like spontaneous remission and then all of a sudden everything will come back with a vengeance. For me, I've, I've just sort of adapted this like maintenance lifestyle change, you know, mindset. And I've, I'm not, I don't need to be nearly as as strict with it at now as I am as I used to have to be. Um, like I can eat a little bit more sodium now. I'm more flexible now. I, I have more of a intuitive sense of where I am with things than I used to have. Um, but I do, yeah, I do have like a fear that maybe like what would what would happen? You know, it's always in the back of my mind. Like if if it suddenly got really bad again, and you know, or if I started being triggered by um, something different that I couldn't control. And I have, and part of what's fueling that fear is over the years, like I have changed, it has changed a little bit for me. So like, whereas before sodium, too much sodium and stress and sleep deprivation, those were like probably my three biggest triggers. Now I'm much more sensitive to noise. Um, and, and very like, so I haven't had my hearing tested in a while and that's something I'm, I'm meaning to do. Uh, but like now I, I, for a long time, I could go to a concert I would gen prob I would usually wear like musicians earplugs most of the time, which is a kind of earplug that just reduces the sound without muffling it. Um, but I wouldn't always, and I, I would do okay in concert situations. Now I can't go to a concert without the earplugs or even regular earplugs. I'm lucky that I can still go at all. A lot of people are triggered by like visual stimulus too, like like heavily triggered by like um, like shopping malls and grocery stores and things like that. Uh, but because my it's sort of changed for me, like now I'm much more like sensitive to like loud restaurants and 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 um, it's hard for me to like pick out the conversation and maybe that's hearing loss related, maybe that's uh, just 
overall sensitivity to noise. I'm not exactly sure at this point, because again, I haven't had my hearing checked in a while, but all of that sort of fuels that fear. But I mean, at the end of the day, I, I just sort of try to not, I, I don't think about that most of the time. I just live my life and I try to just keep doing the things I know that are helpful and, you know, there's nothing really, I, if it changes one day, it changes and hopefully I'll be able to adapt. It's hard, you know, you can't, I try not to be in fear of that all the time, but that is something that is in the back of my mind. So I think I think I saw there was one other person in the back had a question, maybe. Maybe not. Last <laughs> <laughs> right. chance for questions. All right, well, thank you, Glenn, that was fabulous. Oh, uh, I really appreciate it. I'm glad the technology works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, take care and thank you again. And um, bye, guys. Enjoy your day. Thank, thank you. you. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.